Are people connected now? Can I hope you can hear us from the Zoom? Okay, so today we have the pleasure to have Mark here. I'll explain some, uh, he's, he's moved a lot. I'll make a summary. Of he studied uh, PhD in molecular dynamics on proteins. You have to see him first. He was on proteins and then he saw the light and changed <laughs> the genomes. That's my that's my that's my understanding. We, we hope Victor is gonna do the same at some point. <laughs> we'll do the same at some point. Yes, yes, yes. Just chicken out. <laughs> So after the PhD in uh, Autonomous University, so you did the PhD, you moved to New York, Rockefeller University with uh, Andre Salis group. And then you moved to San Francisco, always on protein structure and folding and unfolding. And 2006, you start your, for the first time your group in the Príncipe de Felipe in Valencia, also with proteins a little bit. A little bit started to change, and since 2013, you got the CREA position, and he's now in the TENAC CRG and now concentrated on genomes and uh, full time, yes, uh, structure of chromatin <clears throat> and relationship with diseases and with function. Yes, thank you very much, and the uh, floor is yours. Gracias, David. Thank you for being here, guys. Uh, do you hear me back there? Yeah. Good. I brought two stories. The first one is the title of the thing that you got it in your email, which is about using structure-based genome editing to understand how uh, sex determination happens in mammals. I have a second story. I don't know if I'm gonna have time to tell you the second story, but we'll see when we reach the, the, the point. It's something that is gonna be published soon. And we are very excited about it. Also genome structure, but we'll see if we reach time. What I'm going to tell today is all about the genome structure. So the genome is this molecule of two meters long. And we have in each one of our cells two meters of DNA. Imagine how, ma how many meters of DNA you carry in your body. And it has to fall. And it falls inside the nucleus. And there are ways of studying how it falls inside the nucleus and what happens with this folding. And it's all about this. So put your 3D glasses on, because this is not about the, about the linear genome. It's about how the genome folds. The first story is uh, driven by, excuse me, driven by Juan, a uh, computational guy who was in my lab doing his uh, first postdoc, and now he's in Denmark doing a, <clears throat> doing a second postdoc. And Irene Mota was doing all the experiments in Berlin uh, under the supervision of Dario Lupianez, who is a uh, uh, world expert on three-dimensional genomics and development. And we did the work with them uh, that I'm going to tell you. It's about sex determination. Now, sex determination has been around in, in the minds of people for millennia. At the beginning, people thought that to determine the sex of your newborn, there would be some god that would decide whether it's going to be a girl or a, or, or a boy. Not long time ago, there was a theory about left and right sex determination. It means if you have sex on your right side, you will get a boy. And if you do it from the left side, you will get a girl. But then science came to the rescue of all of us and gave, gave us the freedom of movement. <laughs> because in the 90s, it was discovered that this region, which is a gene that is in the Y chromosome, so half of you have this region, the other half don't, this region gets activated during development at a particular time point, and that activates a cascade of other genes being activated. You'll see them later. And that determines a boy, okay? If this region is not activated, then by default, it will be a girl. And that is how it works. Now, what are those genes and what do we know? As you can see, three is right there. Three, if it gets activated and only the Y chromosome has it, We'll activate SOX9, which is a transcription factor, and SOX9 starts repressing LSPO1, Fox2, and WINT4, which are essential for determining uh, female gonads. Okay? So you can see that they counteract each other, they inhibited each other. So at the moment you start one of the pathways, the other one gets shut down. Okay? 
And that is why we have this differential gonads in uh, our, our um, differential cell types in our gonads, because during development at 10.5, this is one of the times of development, and this is in, in mice, the cells of the gonads are bipotential, really. They could be one or the other. It doesn't matter which sex you are, they could become what is called sertoli for the males in the room, or granulosa for the girls in the room, okay? The woman in the room. What Dario did very nicely in his group in, in Berlin was to sort very specifically the, the cells that will become either granulosa or sertola at 10.5, and then the sertoli and pregranulosa cells at 10.5. And this is very important, not trivial. You have a, a lot of gonads that you have to dissect, sort, et cetera, all the cells, but it's essential because as you will see later on, the structure of the genome is specific of cell type. So when you do all these type of experiments, you have to really have an homogeneous population of cells. Doing high C or this type of uh, chromosome conformation capture in a tissue that has a lot of different cell types is gonna give you a blurred picture of what is happening and not a specific picture of what is happening. Mm -hmm. So that was done. So we will have four time points or uh, sex, sex specific or temporally specific, so four samples of very homogeneous cell types. And then Dario and his team, Irene in particular, did these two types of experiments. I hope you are all familiar with these two types of experiments. If not, I can always go into yeah. details. So they did HiC, which is the genome wide unbiased version of chromosome conformation capture. It is molecular biology 101, it's not super complicated. It has restriction in enzyme, cutting, radiation, et cetera. The, the key point is it gives you this type of maps. What are these type of maps under here? In the, in the, in the x-axis, you have the chromosome position or the uh, genomic coordinates. What you see here is four megabases of DNA from the beginning to the end. And then if, if two pieces of DNA interact a lot in the genome, they will, for example, these peaks here, or these triangles, it means that they, in your population of cells, were very often in contact in the cell. Two parts of the genome that are in contact. If it is yellowish, it means that they are not that much in contact. And this is what you have to understand of these plots. And the second type of experiment they did is a much more common experiment, SHIP-6, where you have a particular or not mark in a particular part of the, of the genome, and again, the same coordinates down here and the peaks of the chip seek, in this case, K27 saturation. I'll tell you why. Okay. So if you are familiar with these two types of experiments, let's start analyzing that. What you have here is the four uh, times points or the four samples. And then you can see by eye that there are no major difference in the structure, even though one will become sperma and the other ones will become ovaries very different transcriptional programs going on in these two cell types, but the structure is very similar. And it was already similar at 10.5 when it was dry potential. So the first surprise when we did this experiment is that the structure gets determined very early during development. We, we hoped that this was not totally set. However, there are slightly differences. What you have down here is something called the insulation score. This line here, it tells you whether a particular region seems to be isolated from the neighbors up and down the streets. So when you have a drop, a valley, it means that this particular point are separated. And you can see here, one of the big valleys, these guys here interact more often between themselves and these guys here interact more often between themselves, but they do not like to interact that much across them, okay? And then you have a, a drop in the insulation score. Now you can see that the four lines are very close to each other, except exactly that particular point I have shown you, which have a big dip in uh, male 13.5. So there is subtle differences, but not a lot. Genome-wide, very little differences, only a few points. So if I look at genome-wide, the boundaries, they don't change really. And there are about, these are called boundaries between these topologically associating domains, for those of you who have heard the, the vocabulary of three-dimensional genomics. But these boundaries don't change dramatically across the samples, except for example, for a very little number of them that either get stronger or weaker. If they get weaker, it means that they have crosstalk between them. If they get stronger, it means that they are more separated. But very few, 
of the about 6,000, only a handful of them change. So really nothing is really changing about it. There is another thing that we can calculate from these maps, which is not depicted in this uh, particular slide, which is compartmentalization. The genome is compartmentalized between active and inactive. And this is very much cell type specific because our genome is the same in all our cells, but obviously my liver, my liver and my brain are activating very different genes. And that is shown in the structure of the genome compartments. What I can show you is that only about 5% to 10% of the genome changes in this process, in this compartmentalization. It means that 5% of, of the entire genome either was a, a active and went to inactive or from inactive went to active. So very little changes. And that was very much surprising. We were hassled by this, by this. So we started to think what are the types of analysis we can do that are not the standard analysis. This is standardly done in, in three-dimensional genomics. What are the type of analysis we can do to come up with uh, different solutions that tell us what is happening in this process. And we developed something called a metallocyte. Now, metallocyte was developed by Juan, who is a Metallica follower. So that's why it's called metallocyte. But it's also the, 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 the change of uh, thinking about the genome. We don't talk about one loci at a time. We talk about a sort of a combination of regions of the loci that are shared in the same space, okay? And by space, I mean three-dimensional space. So what the metallocyte needs, it's high C and anything in the coordinates, okay? Anything, anything that you guys, because you do that continuously, anything that you guys put in the coordinates of the genome can be used for running metallocyte. In the case that I'm gonna to talk today is K27 acetylation, H3K27 acetylation, which is a good proxy or a decent proxy of activity enhancers that are active, uh, activating genes, okay? And promoters that are active. Now, how metallocyte works? I'm gonna walk you through it. This is again, the same region than before, four megabases uh, around chromosome 11. At 10 kilobases, the high C is resolved at 10 kilobases. So every single point that you have here is 10 kilobases of DNA, okay? And they go from the blue to the red. And I'm gonna try to help you to figure out whether this Kamada Kawai layout, which you guys work in graph theories, there are many ways of laying out a graph. And this is one of them, Kamada Kawai. It's a decent representation of the interactions that you observe in the high C. If I color each one of these regions, so the, the yellow one will correspond to the first topologically associated domain, this triangle at the diagonal that you see at the beginning of the map, that seems divided in two smaller triangles. So this will be one of them, and this is the other, the other one. Then the green one is a bit more complex. It has a lot of internal interactions happening. You can see looping in, looping out in this particular region. Then the, the purple one is the tiny topologically associated domain within the larger one, and so on and so forth. So I hope that you see that this is a bona fide representation of the high C. But I don't want you to leave this room thinking that this is what happens in the cell. Because the cell, this, this is extremely dynamic. Don't even think about proteins or RNA that are compared to the genome are way more stable in their structures. The genome is continuously looping in and looping out, but when you do an average picture with the interactions, you observe this type of conformations, okay? So this is an average picture of what is happening. It's very unlikely that any of the cells where the experiment was done has this structure. Some will have the first that built, some of them will have the second, some of them will have part of the third, et cetera, et cetera. The average picture is what you see here. So we also have K27 acetylation. Let's actually look how this K27 acetylation signal looks now in the space. I have this layout and I have the signal linearly, but how it looks like when I put, I color each one of the points by the coverage of the K27 acetylation of this, this 10 kilobases. And this is how it looks like. By eye, you start seeing that this is now not randomly distributed in space. You can start seeing parts that are a bit more uh, brownish and parts that are a bit more uh, bluish. If I plot it this way, and this is a Voronoi representation of the same plot, Voronoi volume representation, I guess you are familiar with that. You can now see very much clearly 
these particular hot spots of K27 acetylation in space versus the cold spots of K27 acetylation in space. By the way, we call that Gaudi plots for obvious reasons. Okay. Now, if I look at it, I, I start seeing. So you go here. Start seeing a lot of brown here, dark brown here, uh, quite a bit around here, and a lot of dark uh, blue around here. So. By eye, you can pick up these things. And let's remember, they don't need to be nearby in sequence because this hotspot that I have mentioned before is separated by more than almost half a megabase in sequence, okay? So they are very separated in sequence, but they come all together in the space. But uh, should I go through the entire genome and look at these Gaudi plots one by one and see? Well, I cannot do that, so I turn to geostatistics. Mm -hmm. In geostatistics, for decades, there is something called the local modern site that has been used for actually representing data in maps, in cartographic maps. So in here, for example, water, water I'm, I'm just made in this up. I don't know what this plot does, but water, zinc in water in, in England, okay? Each one of these dots is somebody going there and measuring zinc in the water and putting the, either it's high or low, and that's in the x-axis. This particular point has a lot of zinc in water and that particular point has very low. But then ask, ask again, what about the neighbors? Are they high or low? And that is the y-axis. It's called in local modern side uh, vocabulary, the lagging. It's not exactly the average of the neighborhoods, but very close. And that basically tells you that, for example, this point here is low in zinc and the neighborhood is also low in zinc. And this point here is high in zinc and the neighborhood is also high in zinc. Okay, as simple as that, it's not rocket science. Then you shuffle the, me the measure, shuffle the points and shuffle the measure, you calculate and some statistics, you do that 10,000 times, and then it tells you whether a particular point is statistically significant after the shuffle. And those are the ones in dark here. So we will have high, high in one corner, low, low in the other quadrant. And then you also have sometimes uh, significant cases of high, low. I have a lot of zen, but my neighbors don't and the other way around. My neighbors have a lot of zinc, but I don't, okay? Now, can I do that in the genome now that I have a map and I have a signal that I have mapped in the genome? Yes, I can do that. And this is the real scenario. Now I'm gonna tell you what the locus is. This is the SOX9 locus. Remember the second on board, three activate SOX9. There was subtle differences. The subtle differences were in the actual boundary where the gene is, the gene is being expressed and generates a boundary. This is known in three-dimensional genomics. When a gene is very much expressed, start generating boundaries, separating things. And this is the layout at 10.5 and at 13.5 for male. The male is the only one that activates SOX9, remember? SOX9 is in the green dot. I don't, I'm not sure you guys from the back see it, but it's right there. And then there are two enhancers that are known to be important for the uh, regulation of SOX9. And I also plotted them in here. Now, if I take the signal, K27 acetylation, and I plot it with the Gaudi plots, you can see that SOX9 actually goes from something that looks bluish to something that looks brownish right now. Okay? So there has been a change in environment for the SOX9. And in fact, it is statistically significant because this is the uh, four quadrants of the local modern side. This is the point where the gene sits and it's high in acetylation. So the gene is acetylated, but the environment is not acetylated, high, low. And it goes at 13.5 to high, high. Okay. And this is exactly this point here in the layout. And it becomes what we call a high, high metallocyte. This is what we call a high, high metallocyte. So the gene now is inside an environment that is very much acetylated. That is what it means. So it's very interesting. You can also plot the same data, which is a bit cumbersome, to simply like this. We call gene, gene trips or gene transitions. The, one of the reviewers asked us to change the transitions. We're gonna humor the reviewer. It goes from high, low to high, high, okay? This is the trip or the transition that SOX9 makes from high, low to high, high. But now we can run it for all the genes in the genome, 20,000 genes in the genome of the mouse, approximately, changing every week the number. And this is what we get. 
All the ones that I, you have here, this is about 50 of them. They have been annotated in the literature important for sex determination in males. And they do this trip and the majority have to be activated, except few of them, the ones in blue that needs to be repressed. So we are actually capturing what is expected to be captured, but we have not run it only for this 50, we have run it for the 20,000. And what you have in the plot in the middle is 10.5 male, 13.5 male, and you can see that we had about 2,000 genes in, in a high, high environment and about 136 in a low, low environment. That multiplies by 2, 13.5, which was expected. This is determining the, the transcriptional program. Before, it's a bit more lax because they are more stem original, and now it's, determined the, it's much more determined now in the quarters, in the upper and lower quadrants. How many genes do this trip that go from lower part to upper part? There are 720. 720 genes make this trip or these transitions. And if you throw them into a go terms, I'm showing you everything that we find, not just what I'm interested to you to see, but everything that we find are all of these terms in, in, in go terms. And as you can see, we detect Sertoli development, male gonad, et cetera, et cetera. That was expected, but obviously the, the the method is agnostic to at the, at the beginning. But we also get uh, copper ions, ions and metal ions. We still don't understand why. Dario thinks it's because during this process, a lot of enzymes are being activated and enzymes require cofactors and these cofactors are normally ions. And so you need to pump them in. So probably this is what happening. In other types of, uh, in the tree of life, in amphibians and reptiles, ions can determine sex. The ions in the environment, the water, the temperature, all these can determine sex. So maybe that's reminiscent, but Dario doesn't think this is the case. But then there are many other uh, RNA processing that he's very, very much interested on this particular process. So we have a, a method that now can detect what is happening in the cells that we study, and this is cool. Now we have uh, 720 genes that Dario is super happy to have because he works on sex determination. Um, but what else can we do? We can make simulations. What happens if I have this layout and now I start perturbating it in silico, in the computer? What you see here is FGF9. Remember the third on board, three SOX9, FGF9. In FGF9, what I'm doing here is I am removing interactions and removing signal in silico. And I'm asking myself, is FGF9, which sits in the middle of this plot, is FGN9 changing the state when I remove something that is two megabases upstream or when I remove something that it is two megabases downstream? And if the plot, if the, if the dots are on top of this line that you see here on top of the gray line, it means that nothing happens to FGF9. You can do whatever you want in that part of the genome that nothing happens. But there are points that change. There are points that if I remove them, if I delete this region here, I predict that FGF9 will not be anymore a hotspot of acetylation, okay? Therefore, I predict that we'll shut down expression. That point here is about 1.1 1 .1 megabases away. So it's really far in sequence, okay? Normally you would not even bother to look at both sides. There are other regions here that is also very interesting. The region here, but very close to the gene, you are perturbing the gene. So it's very difficult to say much about when you are very close and that region here. So uh, we send that to Dario and Dario put it into the genome browser and start looking at it very carefully. And he says, okay, this is cool, but if I remove this region here, I will be removing three genes. So I, I can make a deletion, I can CRISPR out and then if I remove these three genes, I have to convince the reviewers that these three genes are not important for sex determination. Okay, so it's tough. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go for these ones here. I'm gonna remove these guys here that have no genes. It's a gene desert area. It has very little annotation of any other type of enhancers, uh, et cetera, in all the cell types of the, of the mice. In fact, nothing in gonads, nothing. It's not annotated anything there. So I'm gonna remove this and see what happens. So he generated one deletion that we call 306. So he deleted all of these in vivo, 
it generates uh, embryos with that deletion. Okay. And then we submitted the paper. As you can you will see in the next slide, everything worked. Otherwise, we wouldn't have submitted the paper. But then then the reviewers say, well, you know, guys, you're removing you're removing 300 ki kilobases of DNA. Can you be a bit more precise? So we have done two more, 109 and 93, mm -hmm. and we're waiting for the results of 104. Then we also did the what we call 225, which is almost 300. It's not 300, mm -hmm. but it's very close to the gene. It's only about 50 kb from the gene. Okay. That we predicted very little should happen. And then we're waiting for this one, which is far away, and we've also predicted very little should happen. So what are the results? Metaosai predicts this, and the results in vivo, these are mice embryos, they are killed at, at uh, day 15 because all, the, all these genes are pleiotropic. They are not only the gonads, okay? And these, these guys have uh, mutated all the body because it starts with the embryo, with one cell. So they will be born without lungs and without heart and for ethical reasons they are killed. Although we are trying to figure it out because this is cell type specific. We are trying to figure it out and we get in the results this week whether the expression of the genes in other tissues is also affected. We hope it's not. And then, then bingo, because it will be very, very nice. Anyway, the wild type, if you are a male, you get testes and they look like this. And if you are a female, you get ovaries and they look like this. What happens if you do the delta two to five in six of six embryos that was uh, that we made so far that you made at this lab, Irene? All of them look like testes. So the one that is closer to the gene has no effect. Okay. The TO6 I have already mentioned. Sixteen embryos so far. We have twelve of them are over testes and four of them are ovary like. So they are not really testes. This is this in the field is called sex reversal. So in, in reality, you have a male now that you have ovaries, okay? The delta 93, somewhere in between the two states, which is the one in the middle. It has a midterm effect. One of, the, of four look like a testis, two of four look like ovary testis, and one of four look like ovary like. And finally, the one of four, we have only two cases, it's too, too little, I mean, four cases is little, but this is too much little. We're waiting for more embryos. They are so far over testes, all of them. So our predictions are confirming what we see, morphologically and genetically. This is RNA sick. The wild type is the gray. And you can see that 306 reduces to one third the expression of uh, FGF9. FGF9 is there, but expressed only one third, which is not enough to generate testes. Okay. 2205 reduces, but not a lot, I mean, about 30%. And it is enough to generate testes. This is small reduction, but it's still you get testes. And 104 is somewhere in, be in between the two cases. Interestingly, the cascade that I was mentioning at the very beginning gets uh, activated because all these genes are important for the female and they get activated in the two mutants that should be activated. In the wild type, they are shut down, okay? And they are not activated in the 225, which is the one that we predict nothing would happen. So the story tells us that with metalocyte, we have characterized for the first time because working on sex determination has certain taboos, historically speaking. And even nowadays, you have to be very careful because what is sex? What is gender? What is a disease? What is a syndrome? What is a, a difficulty? It's difficult. So not a lot of people actually work on sex determination. It was the first regulatory landscape of sex determination in this paper. Um, it's under revision, so we hope it's going to go through. Metalocyte is an unbiased method. As you can see, I have talked about loops a little bit, topologically associated domains quite a bit, boundaries. But metalocyte doesn't pre-calculate any of this. It just takes the high C, builds a layout, throws the data on top of the layout. So we don't have to calculate any of this which each one of the methods that calculate these things have their own particularities. And I can tell you because I've been in this field for 15 years now, and each one of them has their own particularities, <laughs> including our own. Uh, Metalocyte is a predictive tool. We can make a prediction. As you have seen, we have discovered long non-coding regions, sorry, non-coding uh, regions that regulate 
one of these genes. We have another one, uh, SOX9. We have also discovered in SOX9 new regulatory regions. Uh, I have not talked about the regulons. We, have, we can use this data to calculate regulons as a SENIC does. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the SENIC. And um, I have not talked about this with these regulons, MACE1 and MACE2, which are fact transcription factors that were not ever associated to the expression, the <laughs> regulation of sex determination has been determined through this method as new transcription factors for sex regulation. I'm repeating myself, but this is uh, Juan and Irene's work, really. They are not anymore in our respective labs. They are now in, well, Irene just finished the PhD and Juan now is in, in Denmark. This is the rest of the people in the lab. Uh, if you go to Senag, you will see them, uh, say hi. Nowadays, the work is continued by Alex, Iago, and Leo in red here, which are the guys who continue metallocyte applying it to other stuff, including GWAS. I was talking to David on our work on GWAS, throwing GWAS to these layouts. You can imagine what could happen, right? Um, because you can throw anything. Anything that has linear coordinates, just throw it and see what happens into these layouts. So this is the first story. Maybe if you have questions now, or I go directly to the second story, if you want. I've been talking for 20, 30 minutes. Yes. This this sounds like genomic allospace. Um I I I wonder, I mean you're cutting a region, right? And I wonder, can you modify the sequence of that region instead of deleting? Yes. And I don't know, do a randomized set of letters that follows some distribution and is it doing the same effect? It's a it's a very good question. We are working in another project when we make insertions rather than divisions. And when you make an insertion or change the sequence for inversions or translocation, it's a bit more difficult because we will have to predict new interactions. What I'm doing here is the leading interactions. That's relatively easy. And I am guessing that nothing else is happening around, which is a, a very strong guess. Probably totally wrong, so that's fine. Um, but it's certainly something it means that I have to predict what would happen in the structure, and we're working on this, but we are not ready yet to say much about it. But we are working actively on this. Yes. What's following up on this? I mean, what is the model? What do you think is happening? Is just an enhancement there? What what is it? So what happens, uh, and we, we talk about this in the paper. Uh, the way that all of this works is by, let me get this. The genome is followed by, by something, by, by many means, but the, the, the main force is something called loop extrusion. Uh, the genome is, let's imagine it's pseudo-linear and cohesin, which uh, binds sister chromatins, and now we also know binds non-sister chromatin, will go anywhere and start extruding. It extrudes loops. And imagine you have a gene here and then uh, an enhancer somewhere, and that enhancer has transcription factors on it. You get this through, and, and then suddenly it's, it's a bit more difficult to extrude because there is, a, there is a traffic jam. Stays for a while enough to activate the gene. And then it continues through them. And then it breaks and starts again somewhere else, somewhere else. Now, what happens if you put a lot of enhancers one near the other, that the probability that the gene will find those enhancers is higher? It's not that they are all the time forming the loops like this as I draw them. It is not this. It is that the probability that during this process, that gene doesn't encounter any enhancer is very low when you have this formed, this probability form. And it's much higher than not having any enhancer, for example, at 10.5 for FGF9 compared to at 13.5, okay? And just because the structure changes slightly and the position of those enhancers, the position of the acetylation mark changes as well during time. And that changes the probability of that event happening. And that is how we envision this. There are other forces going on, but they are more long range distance. Uh, in our field, long range means beyond 10 megabases, okay? Uh, in that sense, which are Polycom, for example. Polycom is a very strong uh, genome organizer, but bring things together that get silence. And the long range systems, and those those probably stay much more quiet, not doing a lot of loop extrusion and stuff like that. Yeah. 
what, what is the input of metal aside? The input of metal aside is always a chromosome conformation capture data, whether that's high C, micro C, or any other C, and anything that has a bet file. Yeah. If you have a bet file of a big week, you can combine it with anything. Anything. I did a test. Number of enmers of AAA, for example. And I went through the genome and I calculated in these 10 kilobases how many AAA in a row I have. And I plotted this. Should be almost random, right? Well, actually, it is not because we know A and Cs and AD and GCs are not random. It's almost very difficult to find anything that is not, that is totally random in the genome, actually. Anyway, but, but that would be a crazy idea, right? It has to be as a measure that is as continuous as possible. Uh, ones and zeros is very difficult. Yeah. Because if you imagine your four quadrants of the local yeah. moran side, you will have only here and here. You will have only the four. It's the statistics, then it breaks, really. But you guys put a lot of things in the coordinates, so. My guess is two, two. But, I mean, first of all, you only do this with science because you can. Thank you. <laughs> you are thinking in the folding. Obviously, <laughs> obviously. But so you mentioned at the beginning that it's really moving randomly. It's, it's not moving randomly, but it's moving a lot, much more than proteins. But and that's that is all, not. all these regulation events, it has had to be evolving through times to bring things closer at some yeah. well thought. I don't know. Well, it was evolving, and it, so there must be some some proportions in the gene that, that will yeah. favor this association and should be easy to identify. It, it is. You remember these boundaries I mentioned that gets stronger or weaker? They have something called a CTCF. CTCF is a transcription factor that reaches a specific sequence, very specific, that can get methylated. The Cs can get methylated, DNA methylated in this case, not, not the nucleosomes. And that generates boundaries. When you have CTCF, it generates boundaries, very strong boundaries, and that separates things. There is a lot of transposomic elements that carry CTCF sites. And they jump and generate new boundaries. Okay. Now this so boundary, this boundary is, in, is relevant for whatever I have to do. I keep it. If it is not, it, who cares? Then methylating it, not methylating during development. For example, genes associated to development, the Cox, for example, Cox cluster of genes, they have CTCF in a kind of periodic positioning. And early in development, the first one is accessible. The other ones are not. Later in development, the second one is accessible, and then you are opening the, the, the topological as you say to the main becomes bigger and bigger. And now the genes, the enhancers that are here are available to the genes that were early in development in the other side, but now are, are here, are with me. So all of this, CTCF is very important. It's the only one that we know it's very important, but there must be more. There must be more, and, and the field as a field is looking for those regulatory elements at the structural level. And then you could compare a species and then bring some new uh, things. You can, you, can, you can add CTCF sites, generate a boundary, and that enhancer is not available to you anymore. You can in make inversions, and that, that, for example, there are cases of polydactyly where this has happened. So the, the people has an inversion, and now enhancers that are where it's supposed to be activated later on in development, they get activated to everything. And then you get six fingers, eight fingers. And relational, relating all this to sickness, the you known sickness and, and, and pharmacology, how, how we are doing this? We are that now discovering these things, uh, how far it is, and it's gene therapy, basically. It's not pharmacology, it's gene therapy. CRISPR, CRISPR shutting down enhancers, because you can shut down a particular enhancer, CRISPRing out a particular boundary, etc., etc. And that's particular molecules that really inhibit that association. This is a this is a normal process genome wide. I mean, you have to really target it to the sequence if you want that particular site to be affected. Because acetylating the DNA, the, the nucleosomes is genome wide. In fact, many cancers have this perturbated, and therefore you get cancer. So okay. Now, David, you tell me. Do I go for the second story or will we leave it here? Oh, it's the second story. I, I can make it very quick. 
it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a super fun story. It's a nice, nice story. This is going to get published and sell in, in two weeks from now. And we call it fossilized chromosomes. We took a sample of 52,000 years old, and we did high C on them, and the structure is still there. And it's mammoth. OK, so it comes from Siberia. These are the, the heroes of the story. Again, fun from our lab. But this is driven really by the Gilbert lab and Aiden lab. And Olga has been instrumental for this. Marcella and Cynthia did the initial experiments that took, this is 10 years old project because it was a lot of failure until it worked. And then Olga and Juan did the analysis of this, okay? Now the question is this, the question is this. you take something that is very, very old, this is paleo uh, uh, ancient DNA. And the question is, is the structure still there? or has been lost. If you think about it, the DNA is totally broken. That's for sure. You do ancient DNA and the maximum length is 100 base pairs. And maybe some of you have done ancient DNA analysis. The question is, these pieces of DNA have diffused enough to have lost the structure? This is the question. So they're, still, they're broken, but they're still in place. And you can guess that they are still in place. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be telling that story. <laughs> now, the sample comes from uh, this couple of uh, gentlemen here in Siberia. And Siberia is a piece of the ear of one uh, female mammoth that was uh, depresmaphrost. So it was in permafrost, but it was taken out. That's 2018. Okay. And, and histologically speaking, the nucleus are still there. So it's a very nice sample. And you can see here follicles and all of these. You can see, histologically speaking, it was it was promising, this particular sample. Okay, we tried all the samples and it was much, much, much different. By the way, the experiments are done at the Aiden lab in, in the US. We did the uh, analysis um, and Tom Gilbert was uh, responsible for getting all these samples to, to us and do some of the initial experiments as well. What is in the genome? This is a question. What is expressed on individual tissues? Remember, the genome structure allows you to tell you whether genes were active or inactive. So you can consider these paleotranscriptomics. The RNA is not there anymore. The RNA is gone, long gone. But the genes are either inactive or inactive. And then what this expression, that, what this expression tells you. So let me answer these three questions before. Now, there is very few changes in the high C protocol. We call it paleo high C just for, for the fun of it. But there are very few changes, really. It's, it's almost high C, but uh, you have to be very careful. We did a lot of samples, but you can see that only the one in the top gave uh, enough data. And this is percentage of maps read, uh, reads that map. Now, the number, the number in the table are, is, is scary, and it's really scary. 4.4 billion reads. 1.7 million interactions. So it's an expensive experiment. And only the Lieberman Aiden lab can do these type of things. Uh, we cannot. However, the distance of base pairs on high C <laughs> is much longer. So the pairs that you obtain is much longer. Even though the, the pieces are broken, that means that they were nearby a space and you have been able to relegate them. So when you map them into uh, modern elephants, you have long range interactions, not tremendously long range interactions up to maybe a few um, kilobases long, but, but that's what you get. Now then Olga, who has been working on this type of problems for many, many years, uh, came up with this uh, assisted assembly. The assisted assembly is very simple. The, I don't know how familiar you are with HiC, but HiC can be used to assemble genomes de novo for a very simple reason. I am a polymer, DNA is a polymer, and whatever is next to me in sequence, up or downstream, it will go with me everywhere I go. I go, they come with me. It's okay. impossible to break it. Okay. Well, not impossible, but it will be very bad if it, if it breaks. Which means that if I interact a lot with these two guys, it means that they are nearby the sequence. That is what it means. And therefore, I'm able to use this data to ensemble genomes. And this is done now routinely, thanks to Olga and Job Decker at the beginning had a couple of papers on this, so many people have worked on it. No, we have never worked on assembly. Tyler Lariotto at the Senate works on assembly using high C. First, 
collect the mutations with respect to the original elephant, the first thing. Then you do the high C and you start seeing weird stuff like this one here. This looks like chromosomes in high C, but these two interact. And chromosomes, they don't like to interact with each other much, as much as within themselves, because it's a polymer. You think about it. It's Which means that this piece here, with respect to the reference genome that you have used, wasn't there. It could have two things. It could have that it's inverted. So you first reinvert, and you find these points and change it, and then repositioning it so that the map looks like this. The only thing you do, you take this piece, put it up there, this one comes down, and all these interactions are now together. Obviously, this seems trivial. <coughs> Uh, you get things like this, and then you, your puzzle is a bit more complicated, but Olga has sorted out the, uh, the algorithm to get, end up. And this is the first assembled mammoth genome based on high -seed. We were super excited about it, but at the same time, very sad because there is nothing special at the chromosomal level of the mammoth compared to the modern marathon. Nothing. There's no translocations, no new chromosomes, nothing. So from the point of view of evolution, a very boring differences between the two species. Anyway, we can use assembly of an extinct species now. Second, compartmentalization. It works like this. I'm putting now chromosome 10. You start seeing this checker box. Okay, this, this kind of... Black, red and white, red and white, red and white. This is the compartments. You do a cross correlation of the matrix. And then you calculate uh, the cross correlations. And that what you get is this map. And if it's red, it's likely to be active. And if it's blue, it's likely to be repressed. And this is done by the CG content in this case, because we don't have any other way of doing it. You know, the genes that are active tend to be more, genes active tend to be more in CG rich regions for the housekeeping at least. And then other chromosomes you can see, and if you compare it to the elephant, which is down here, and the mammoth is in the upper corner, and the elephant is the lower corner, no major difference neither. Okay, another disappointing moment in the process. Anyway, but now we know which is active and which is inactive. Is this different? To the elephant in a similar way in all the tissues? No, as I mentioned at the very first talk, this is tissue specific. And what you see here is the skin of the mammoth compared to the skin of the modern elephant and compared to, uh, I don't know what this one, probably I lost the, the, the logo, sorry. But the other one is liver, neurons, and astrocytes, I think. And you can see that the skin of the elephant is the one closer to the skin of the mammoth. Okay, which is nice because that reinforces the fact that so the genes of the skin are important. Are there differences? Well, there are 52 places in the genome where there is a switch of activity, 52. Some of them are here and some of them are important for the growth. Some of them are important for adaptation, immune adaptation. Uh, the paper comes in three weeks. You can read about these details. Immune adaptation to the environment. The majority are important for, guess what? Getting hair. <clears throat> and we discovered that the mammoth is a hair, hairy elephant, basically. <laughs> anyway, this is paleotranscriptomics, if you wish. And then other patterns arise in here. Well, loops. Loops are these corner points. You can see them here. So in, in the other part, I have varied by how we calculate loops, but there are loops in here. You can calculate them in the modern elephant, and you will get about 4,176 loops. And loops is where precisely CTCF stops and creates <coughs> this for a while, a bit longer than other places, and then breaks. These are the loops. And if you collect all the loops, the 4,176 loops, and you make a meta plot, of all the loops, one on top of each other. This is how it looks like in the elephant. If now you take the data that we got and do the same in modern elephants, they are still there. It, they are very difficult to call in the high sea of the elephant because it has very few data. 
uh, it would be almost impossible to say there is a loop there. But we do in the modern elephant, and then we look whether it's enriched as well, these particular positions, equivalent positions in the, the mouth, and they are there. So the loops have been maintained for 52,000 uh, um, 52, years in the permafrost. Another thing that arises, probably biologically relevant, we still don't know how relevant, is that in the X chromosome, this was a female, so one of the two X chromosomes is inactive. When the X chromosome gets inactive, it generates what is called megadomains. And you can see here in human, this part interacts a lot, that part interacts a lot, and that part interacts a lot. Oh, sorry, this second part and this part interacts a lot. In mammoth, we have three partitionings. And we have this cover that does exist. This is only in, in elephantoids, in the mammoth. This peak here of CTCF enrichment. They have a lot of CTCF one after the other. We call it frost for obvious reasons. That one was called ice, not, not, it has nothing to do with, with uh, ice, but it was called ice, historically speaking. So we, we have a new frost. This new partitioning could have, uh, this is the only major differences that we are observing at the level of the structural organization of the chromosomes. So this is cool. We have something that we have demonstrated all of this, but how is this possible? How is this possible that nothing has broken? And it's because the diffusion process is very likely to stop at some point in these samples. So things get broken and they start diffusing. And Einstein told us from the beginning of the 1900s that if, if something is sufficiently small, it will start diffusing very quickly. Okay? And this is help that you guys know it's very, very small. So it should have diffused, but it didn't. So the LS lab started thinking about it and they ended up reading a lot of papers about food, how to preserve food. And it's particular uh, jerky beef. I don't know who has been in the US, but in the US they eat totally dried pieces of meat that are maintained at room temperature. How this process happens, it, it happens because you dry it out very quickly and you put it very quickly under uh, temp, uh, lower temperatures. And this is what happens in Siberia, sorry. In Siberia, when you do this, um, the, the mammoth probably died in a place in the middle of the winter, we, we think, otherwise this would have been very difficult, and, and got dried very quickly and in, low, in, in lower temperatures very, very, very quick. And that maintained what we call chromoglass. Now, glass is a very amorphous structure. It doesn't have a structure. If you look at the how glass is formed, it is a, it's a, a traffic jump uh, that no, nothing can move, but it doesn't have a structure. No lanes, no nothing. It doesn't have a structure. So we think this is what happened here. It doesn't have a structure, and these pieces were broken, but not moving. And that's why we were able to uh, obtain it. How they tested, they took a modern piece of beef. They did high C. This is the high C. And these are loops you can cut. And then after, I think, three days in room temperature, this is how it looks like. Totally destroyed. If you cool and lower the uh, humidity very quick, after one year, you still get this. Okay. So after one year, you still get the loops, original loops. Then you take this sample and you shoot it. And they literally shoot it. I'm not kidding. You run it over a car. It's in the US, so they can do this. You, you, you run over it with a car or you throw a fast ball, a fast fade ball, and it's still there. So this, this was the fun part of the paper. <laughs> After 10 years of nothing working really. <laughs> so the, this, this, this proof to a certain extent, only one year, not 52,000 years, proof to a certain extent that this has worked. So message, very old samples can be used nowadays and the museum are full of very old samples of extinct species, species very difficult to get, species that are in danger that you don't want to kill an animal just to do a HC, where we could probably do this and probably would work, okay? The chromosomes are there, unfortunately not a major rearrangement. The people from Colossal, you know, that company that tries to revive 
the mammoth, they would be happy about this paper because there is hope that they can transform an elephant to a mammoth because there is no major rearrangements. Uh, we have used this for paleotranscriptomics, although the RNA was never investigated because RNA is not there. You, you don't find RNA in these samples. It opens the door for doing other epigenetics in these samples because if the structure is there, chromatin state are probably still there. I don't know how easy it would be to subtract those with antibodies that still work in these conditions, but it could be that. We find a specific interactions that tell us about the regulation of some of these genes. I didn't go into details there. And we think this is chromoglass, and we call it chromoglass. We call them fossilized chromosomes, just because it's fancy. Uh, obviously, it has, they are not mineralized. They, they are still fresh meat, huh? well, fresh. <laughs> They're probably stinky fresh meat, but um, they are there. And this is, this is one of the legs of the same mammoth that they took uh, that day. The work is between the three labs, Juan, Marcela, and Olga and Cynthia are the heroes here with a lot of other people collaborating, and I'm one. Yeah, thank you very much. Short questions, <laughs> this last part. Yes. What are the are there any implications about this for section in the X chromosome inactivated that you can think of? Or if you if you look carefully at the modern elephants, there is heavy. Uh, in other mammals, we don't see it. In principle, it's a new boundary that appears in the inactivated X uh, because of this um, group of CTCF there. We still, I, I, I am not expert on X inactivation to tell him much more than this. It's a very tiny proportion compared to the rest. What do I know is that there are some genes that escape. We, haven't, we don't have enough resolution in these maps to start seeing whether particular genes escape at the very fine detail. We cannot differentiate the inactive and inactive. That's true. This is the mixture of the both. Okay. Uh, so it's very difficult to say anything about it, biologically speaking. Did you sequence entire how much is covered from the modern mammal um, elephant with the uh, ancient? Did it Completely covered. It, most of our rates end up mapping yes. in the modern elephant. Yes, very few. Uh, it, it is in the picture. You you can see it. Very few. We didn't know exactly where to put them. Does the behavior of your chromatin and your chromatin is different? No, it's this part. Here. These are the ones that we don't know exactly what to do. Oh. And they do interact time to time to others, but it's very difficult to really map them. Now, the things that don't map, it doesn't mean, it could well, would mean that we don't map them correctly. It could be yeah. new, de novo sequences in the mammoth compared to the elephant. You can also unmap you can genes unmap. when you sequence a human model. Human yeah. So it's, it's very And obviously, it's long, nice reach, yeah. long reach in these samples. No, no, yeah. Well, it's impossible. There is no, no pieces of DNA remain that are longer than 100 base pairs. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I didn't mention.